Jill, lovely to meet you. And uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Nice to talk to you too. Oh, uh, cool. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read from your uh, website at the moment. It says, Canadian cave diver, underwater explorer, writer, photographer, filmmaker, and a, a whole host of accolades from, from a lot of different bodies. Obvious question to start. Um, what made you get into cave diving? You know, I wanted to be an explorer from the time I was a little kid. I, I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be Jacques Cousteau. You know, I had all these dreams. Um, and I, I didn't get to, to sort of bring those into my life until I was in university. So I, I, I wanted to dive, but um, people in Canada were like, oh gosh, people don't dive here. It's too cold. <laughs> you know? uh, so it, it took me a while to, to figure out how to put that all together. But, but I've, I was that little kid that made a fort inside the closet in this dark space. <laughs> So I've never shied away from caves, whether they're water filled or not. And I kind of like these uh, dark, cozy spaces. I was just watching um, one of your lectures, uh, one of the TED Talks. Mm -hmm. And um, I was quite interested to see the age of the audience. I mean, they were all quite young people. Was it, Was this... It just happened to be young people or were you at a college? I mean, what, what determined their age to come and listen to you? Yeah, once a year, Ted does a special um, Ted function called Ted Youth. And so it was in Brooklyn, New York, and all the people were young people. Mm -hmm. What kind of reaction do you get from young people? Are they, are they interested because you're... In, uh, introducing something new to them or is it something that they think they might like to do i spend a lot of time with kids like speaking in schools and these days online and uh the kids are are amazing audiences i think that for them seeing something that's fresh and new and different something they didn't know about is exciting and i think so many of them don't have the kind of outdoor adventure time that I had as a kid. And so it's, it's like peering into this brave new world. And I do get a lot of fantastic questions. And, and so many of the kids that watch, the first thing they want to know is, how old do I have to be when I can scuba dive? You know? Yeah, indeed. And how old do you have to be to learn to scuba dive? Oh, only 10, actually. 10. Or depending on the training agency, 10 to 12 years old, you can get started. Fantastic. It's a great age. It was, it was a lot older when I started, mm. and uh, I kind of feel I miss those early years, but uh, what the hell, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Look, looking at your, your book, um, Cave Diving, um, Into the Planet, My Life as a Cave Diver, fantastic book. Uh, are you finding that that sells... To a specialist audience or once again is that is that a general audience coming to that you know I, I had to find a middle ground like I wanted to write a book well certainly for you know the, the people that I know that are tech divers cave divers so I, I wanted to write a book that was interesting to them and you know told the story of my adventures but I didn't want it to be so technical that it would turn off a general audience because really I wanted the book to have a much wider appeal and and in the end, I think it kind of turned out to be timely. I, I released it in the fall, right before the whole COVID thing happened. And, and really, the, the book's topic is, is fear and uncertainty and change. It's just told through the frame of my, my stories and adventures and expeditions around the world. So I, I think it's kind of a, a good book for the time. Have you found that it's actually influenced anybody to take up diving? Has anybody got back to you and said, wow, your book really influenced me and I'm into this now? Yeah, I, I get a lot, of, uh, a lot of email from, from people and, and even, you know, handwritten notes and cards from, from young kids too. So it's, it's, it's really nice to get that feedback. 
Excellent. Oh, that's so rewarding. That, 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 must be, that must be nice. I was just looking at all the uh, technology involved now in into diving generally. And of course, your technology for your cave exploration with your breathers and everything else. Where do we go to from here? I mean, where, where, where can technology take us next in, in the cave diving exploration field? You know, it's funny. Every time I get involved in something new, I get this flurry of questions like, are we going to be replaced <laughs> by technology? So there will always be a place for the human in exploration and the, the human mind in exploration. But, but I'm really excited by the technology. I mean, rebreathers kicked a door open to explore a whole new level of, of places for people, whether it was deeper or further inside of caves with more backup. Uh, but Honestly, I see more and more, um, you know, robotic, artificially intelligent things coming into our lives, whether that's to create, you know, photogrammetry models of shipwrecks or explore a cave with a autonomous mapping device um, or, you know, who, who knows what's next. I'm kind of hoping like within my diving lifetime that uh, I'll get a chance to pilot an exosuit where I can just get into a, a one atmosphere suit and swim uh, as deep as I want to go. Uh, so I, I kind of hope that's next. Uh, that would be kind of amazing. But funnily enough, I was just talking last week um, to uh, a fellow who, who's been using one of those. Uh, and Were you talking to Phil? I was talking to <laughs> Phil. Of course, uh, it's a very small world, isn't it? It is. I love Phil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, that just sounded so exciting. He, did, he didn't actually manage to get to great depths, but he used it at around 60 feet quite, quite extensively. But, yeah, mm. what a... What a th I remember watching Sylvia Earle uh, yeah. originally do it. And just the thought of being so deep and alone and... Ah, it, it just makes me tingle thinking of it. It's magic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, every time I see Phil, I'm like, oh, I'm envious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, just looking at uh, some of your stuff again, um, 3D modeling of cave systems, that's intriguing. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Uh, back in the you know, mid 90s, I was involved in a, a cave diving project in central Mexico and uh, both dry and, and cave diving expedition. And we had experienced these mudslides in the mountain that just obliterated the visibility in the cave. It was just like like diving in chocolate milk. And and as you know, if you explore a new place, it doesn't count until you've made a map and documented the space that you've been through. And it was really hard on that project. And at the end of that project, sitting around a campfire, um, one of my colleagues, the expedition leader, Dr. Bill Stone said, I can build a device that will let us map the cave, whether we can see the walls, the floor, the ceiling or not. And I looked at him and I'm like, what? I'm in. <laughs> He said, okay, I need two years, I need $750,000 and maybe up to 150 volunteers who are willing to work on this for the next couple of years. And I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> and two years later, I was driving that mapper at Wakulla Springs in North Florida. And uh, it was the first accurate three-dimensional map of any subterranean space, dry or wet. And since that time, the mappers continued to be developed by Stone and his team for um, both terrestrial applications, but also eventually to go to Jupiter's moon Europa and explore the liquid ocean beneath the frozen surface. So it's just amazing to see, the, you know, the arc of that technology and as it's progressed over the decades. Yeah, that would be amazing to... Uh, I hope I live long enough to see the results of, mm -hmm. of the Europa uh, exploration. Yeah. And, yeah. And the, the thought of finding life there would, would be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking about life in caves and things, um, a lot of the stuff you do um, with archaeology in the caves um, and finding human remains, um, evidence of past history, that must be kind of exciting to find something new that nobody's seen before when you do that 
do you actually reveal parts of history that have been unknown or are you just um, clarifying what we already knew? No, I mean, as, as explorers, we, we stumble across things all the time and, and reach out to scientists and, and authorities in the right field and say, hey, you know, we've found X, Y, Z. Do you want to have a look? <laughs> and, and so sometimes we're, we're the ones that find these unusual, you know, phenomena or, or artifacts and we bring in the science team and then we become their hands and eyes in places that they might not necessarily get to. So, so I've had to, you know, delicately document or even retrieve, you know, ancient human remains, uh, you know, archaeology, you know, artifacts, um, new species, um, even, you know, the bones of an extinct sloth in a Cuban cave. So all kinds of different things. So we're often the drivers of that exploration and um and it reveals you know new things that we didn't know about earth's history or past cultures it's it's fascinating so out of all the things in your mind what's been the most exciting thing that you found oh boy in, t in terms of yeah. historical remains <laughs> Gosh, I don't even know if I could pick one. There's just, no. there's so, there's so many. Um, you know, I think some of the things that we've um, recovered in the Bahamas, because so very little was known about the Lucayan people, um, you know, on, on one, one particular dive, we were tasked with going down into a cave in Andros and recovering a, a skull that was buried in the peat about 270 feet deep um, and bringing that up for a paleontologist from from the Bermuda or sorry, the Bahamas uh, Natural History Museum, and that was really amazing. But but what was really interesting is that on the on the same dive, I also picked up uh, a light that had been dropped by Rob Palmer when he first explored that cave. And you know, Rob's no longer with us, but uh, so it was this really really odd kind of like ancient history and then cave diving history and and like the, the gear of a colleague you know um so that one just kind of sticks in my mind it's kind of a memorable dive yeah, interesting how long had that light been down there oh like 20 years or something at least right. yeah 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 As I was saying to, to, to somebody else a while ago in another interview that, that, that there's two things I always said I'd never do, and one was weddings and the other was cave diving. Just, just like, no, no. And, uh, and, and then I got a chance to do a film in the Cenotes in, in um, Yucatan. And that just changed my life. It, it, it was absolutely amazing. Um, but there were so many disciplines to go through when you cave dive and uh, out of all the disciplines which do you think is the is the most difficult to master i mean you have things as well as all the technical stuff you have self-awareness self-control that fear of closed spaces everything so many things so many things what, what's most difficult do you think uh you know i think over time people um i guess erode in their their diligence to their safety protocols it's like I, I mean, you can even equate it to to driving if you drive back and forth to work enough times on the same route suddenly like one morning you arrive at the coffee machine and you don't even really remember the drive right? <laughs> and and you've just kind of forgotten to be dialed in it's become so commonplace and so I think like the mature or more experienced cave or technical diver has to really guard against that complacency that can kind of creep into your daily tasks. If you're, you're diving at the same place all the time and nothing's ever happened, then it's easy to get sloppy. And so, so I think that discipline to always remain vigilant to the safety protocols and, and, and being capable and knowing when to abort, I think that's kind of the rule of, of survivors like you have to be willing to spend all of your savings on your gear and your travel and get to some place on the other side of the planet that you'll never get back to and you have to be within like an inch of success or what you perceive as, as success and then go whoa not today i have to turn around and you know maybe 
maybe I'll never be back here, but you have to be able to be disciplined enough to abort and stay in that sort of risk agreement that you made with yourself before the dive. It's a tricky thing to do. I, I, I know from my own experiences that when you reach that line of should I stop here or should I just go that little bit further because I know it's going to be worth it, it's, it's, it's a difficult choice. And I guess in the end, you have to say, well, it's better to live and <laughs> be here and look at it tomorrow. Um, but I, I know a lot of people do actually push that limit and of course don't make it yeah and there's a lot of pressures on on people today i mean everybody's like always having this performance on social media right and so if you've if you've done something exceptional then then in every interview they'll be what's next what are you going to do next and, and it's like if you're not in the right mindset that can create a lot of pressure um, in order to perform and so the next time you're in that cave and you're at the hairy end of the line and it's like well I really should turn around because of my gas supply oh but I'll just drop in another couple hundred feet of, of new exploration before I do that so I have something to report on social media so I, I think that that I, I mean I didn't grow up with social media so I don't really feel that pressure but I think that I think that younger people today do feel that, especially as they're trying to establish themselves in their career and build a reputation, that they may take unnecessary risks um, that, you know, hopefully they'll just learn to regret as opposed to, you know, getting themselves killed. Yes, Le learn to regret, live to learn to regret. Yeah. yeah that's the absolute key. Have you, have you reached those points where you've actually gone back a, another day and actually found what you were, were hoping there? Or do you get a lot of disappointments, a lot of dead ends? Uh, how does it all pan out over the years? Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's things that I kind of left withering in files like 20 years ago that I go back to and it's kind of nice. I've got this whole collection of, of things that I want to go back to and I want to do. I mean, the cover of my of my book, Into the Planet, is kind of an example of that. Um, you know, when I uh, I write in the book about a serious diving accident that I had when um, my husband at the time and I uh, were exploring a place that we discovered this deep cave system associated with the pit in Mexico, and I got bent, and um, and that was you know, quite frightening. And then I, I didn't get a chance to get back there for 20 years. <laughs> so when I wrote the book, and I knew that I was going to write about that whole experience of getting bent, I thought, oh, I know what the cover of the book needs to be. It needs to be from the place where I first felt the symptoms of getting DCS. It needs to be in that place that almost ended my diving career. And so I went back 20 years later and got in the water and went to the very location where I felt the very first symptoms. And I waited like for a couple of hours until the photo, the light was just right. And then this ghostly figure of a diver swam into the shot, like more than a hundred feet below me. And the silhouette of a diver was like watching my own ghost. And I went, oh, this is the shot, click, you know? And, and I captured the place that, that had so terrified me, you know, 20 years earlier. Wow, that must have been quite liberating. It was. I got out of the dive and I literally, I had a really huge cry. It was, <laughs> <laughs> oh. it was, it was amazing to be able to go back there and, and get that image because I had initially shot images there, but I'd shot them on an old Nikonos film camera. And it's such a big space. It's like going to a football stadium in the dark and um, using a film camera with no tripod when we first explored the place. I had, you know, camera shake in the image. And so to be able to go back and get the shot that had been burning a hole in my brain for 20 years was fantastic. It's interesting you, you mentioned the conus. My God, has, has equipment changed? I mean, especially <laughs> film equipment. Yes. Wow, yeah. I, I mean, I would have died for an Iconis. <laughs> and now oh. I have one on my shelf and it's got that much dust on it. You know, it's such a shame. <laughs> It's, it's it's I have one that I made into a pencil holder, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah. When when you when you do you dive um, without exploration? Do you dive in the oceans at all? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm one of these water babies where. I don't even really like deep diving. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy because I've done some pretty big ones, but um, I just like being in the water. And and if I'm going to take an extraordinary risk, like an extremely deep dive or something, then um, it has got to be worth it. There's got to be a good sense of purpose to it. But I swim, I snorkel, I free dive, I paddle. I just love being in the water. So I... I yeah. Whenever, you know, I'm sort of out of sorts, my husband will be like, I think you need to get wet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how are you managing now with COVID? Are you, are you managing to get wet? Yeah. Well, we're just today coming out of a, a, a complete 100% stay at home that's been enforced since Christmas. So I have not, none of us have been, you know, supposed to even get in our cars and drive places so uh i am definitely getting back in the water <laughs> oh, <laughs> even though it's cold <laughs> yeah well, God, we're still in full lockdown here and uh um, yeah. oh just uh, that that first entry into water is going to be amazing it's going <laughs> to feel sweet <laughs> yeah no, absolutely when you dive normally and um, well like caving or, or or on the reefs or whatever do you find you have to or you want to share, even if it's verbally, everything you've seen? Or do you just become content in seeing stuff and, and putting it in your own mind? No, I'm kind of that that little five or six year old girl that's still in kindergarten doing like show and tell, you know, when you would bring a story to class and share it. Um, I, I'm so excited with the things that I see that, that I, I can hardly dive without a camera to begin with. <laughs> um, but I want to share the stories with people. Yeah, the thought of diving without a camera is is, is just, no. <laughs> God. I feel naked. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's yeah. a funny thing with cameras, even, even, even with a little GoPro. I mean, this is crazy. If you're in a dangerous situation with with... I don't know anything. Having that camera gives you that that false sense of security. You're trying to feel safe behind it, even if it's tiny. You know, you're there with a purpose, and it's not you alone. It's yeah, that's funny, isn't it? You're not going to be able to fend off a walrus or a polar bear or the GoPro, though. <laughs> no, I know, I know. But somehow you feel maybe I could. You know, I'm, not, I'm here to film you. I'm not here to hurt you. No, it's, it's, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. There you are. What, what's, what's next for you? Uh, well, uh, you know, COVID's not going away anytime soon. No. So our borders are closed and, I, and I'm content to, to be diving locally for a while until things can kind of reopen safely again after vaccinations. But I'm really lucky because I, I live on a river and I'm, very close to uh, Canada's longest underwater cave system that I'm exploring. So I'm working, uh, working hard at that until, uh, until I can go play with others and <laughs> start traveling again and restore the expeditions that all got packed away last, last winter. Well, may, may, may it happen very soon. Craig. I hope so. Jo, it's been lovely talking to you uh, and wonderful to meet you. Thank you very much again for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure. It's been great talking to you, too. Oh, cool. Thank you. Well, um, take care. Bye for now.